Welcome to the General Resonance Theory YouTube channel. Today, we have a presentation by Tam Hunt on his paper, Speaking on the Location of Consciousness. We now join this talk already in progress. Research with uh, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation and a lot of alternating current stimulation. Um, yeah, and I'm developing a consciousness theory with Jonathan and been a part of this group for a good while and enjoy the conversations. Great, thank you. Jonathan, go ahead. I'm Jonathan Schooler, professor in, in psychological brain sciences at UCSB. Um, apologies for my camera looking the wrong way. Um, and uh, very interested in consciousness, mindfulness, um, uh, resonance, uh, creativity, curiosity, lots of stuff. Thank you. Colin, go ahead. Hi, Colin Hales, University of Melbourne, um, researcher who's primarily interested in artificial general intelligence and um, as a result ended up in the middle of electromagnetism of the brain and the connection with this group, which has been for a couple of years now, it's been really good. So, awesome. Thanks, building Colin. chips. Yeah, and um, I'll be relying on you quite a bit today in my talk, so thanks for all the work you've done. Uh, Bernard, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm Bernard Carr. I'm a cosmologist at Queen Mary College, University of London, but very interested in consciousness and parapsychology and psychical research. And uh, and also, I found that my ideas are very much very similar to those of Jonathan, although we we derive arrived at them independently. So I guess they must be true. <laughs> Prove it. <laughs> Thank you, Bernard. Good to see you here. Brooke, go ahead. Hi, I'm Brooke Schwartzman. I'm conducting my undergraduate honors thesis uh, under Jonathan's supervision. And I began uh, being interested in this group after Nikki's presentation on resonant breathing earlier this year. So I look forward to today's talk. Great, thanks for joining us. Jack, go ahead. Yes, I'm a retired professor from the psych department at UCSB. Uh, my specialties were vision, touch, hearing, spatial cognition, virtual reality and um, a phenomenology of perception. And I've always been interested in consciousness indirectly, in, but in the last 13 years, very much so. And I've been part of this group since then. And I'm always like looking forward to hearing what Tam has to say. So thank you. Thank you, Jack, for joining us. Nikki, go ahead. Hey, I'm Nikki Johnson, a research affiliate with the Meta Lab at UCSB, working with uh, Tam and Jonathan. Loving it. So. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, Jeff, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Jeff Rouse, uh, psychiatrist at uh, Tulane University and friend of Alan Macy, where I'm the chief medical officer of his company that you uh, slow wave using the vibroacoustic chair to induce altered states of consciousness. Good Great. Thanks for joining us and nice to meet you. I know Alan couldn't join us today because of the Neurofield conference, but um, hopefully he'll watch the recording and give us some feedback and anything you can weigh in today, Jeff, please do. Ellie, good to see your face. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, hey Tim, good to see you too. I'm Elliot. I am a, um, let's see, what am I these days? I'm just finishing up lecturing at UCSB, moving on to a postdoc um, with uh, Ann Taves and uh, looking at the role of perception and cultural beliefs and practices on the frequency and appraisal of non-ordinary experiences and sort of the nature of everyday perception versus spiritual perception, um, if you will. Cool, good to see you. Maria, go ahead. Hi, I'm Maria Feeney. I'm a postdoc at the Center for Consciousness Studies at the U of A. And um, I'm working with ultrasound brain stimulation meditation, but also trying to develop some work around integration for psychedelics and other types of altered states of experiences. Awesome, good to see you, glad you can join us. Cool, well, let me go ahead and dive in. Well, I guess I'll say a word about myself real quick. Um, I've been working with Jonathan Schooler in his lab now for I think a decade, and he and I have been developing uh, the general resonance theory of consciousness and related work. And um, this work today, is um you know theory 
and implication. Uh, it's not based on any empirical work we've done, but it's really trying to tie together a lot of uh, work by others to look at kind of the macro picture of how to explain consciousness and more specifically, uh, what direction to look for uh, explanations of consciousness. Um, so without further ado, let me share my screen here. See if I can find the right one. There it is. <clears throat> can everyone see that? Yes. Great. Yeah, but it's not in, um, there you go. Okay, great. And uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point. I love the dialogue. Okay, so where is consciousness? And I'm going to look at kind of two, um, what I guess Karl Popper would call uh, metaphysical research programs. Um, and this is the, um, the, the spike code theory, spike code approach, which is the prevailing approach in neuroscience and philosophy that looks to synaptic activity generated by neurons as the place to look for consciousness. And then a much newer uh, but growing approach looking at the brain's um, various scales of electromagnetic fields uh, produced locally, regionally, and globally as perhaps a more complete explanation for consciousness. Now, um, who here was at the 2014 uh, Tucson conference? Okay, Jonathan was there. Um, did you attend the Zombie Blues that year, Jonathan? I'm, I think I did. Probably did, but maybe, yeah, maybe you were. Um, those yeah. things are such a lot of fun. Those. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun tradition, yeah. It might, it might have run its course, but anyway, that year was really good. And, and Chalmers, Dave Chalmers, who, of course, was uh, you know, one of the key organizers for years of the conference, um, that year offered a a rhyme about the nature of his hair in relation to consciousness. I went to the barber, got into the chair, said, I'm sick and tired of all this damn hair. He cut off my hair. He cut off my qualia too. That's how I got the short haircut zombie blues. And I won't, I'll spare you the, the full rhyme, but he basically, it, it's a meditation on EM field theories of consciousness in the manner of being like hair that you know emanates from the scalp um, and in fact has a key role in consciousness. And so he, Dave actually cut off his hair, unfortunately, so perhaps he is a zombie now. Um, but he basically introduced really well this idea of the EM field hypothesis and its role in consciousness. And of course, there is a measurable effect of EM fields outside the brain. That's what EEG does. Uh, this is you know, a set of electrodes on the scalp and it's measuring those fields that emanate past the skull and the scalp and gives you a global signal. But there are various scales of EM fields generated by the brain. And I wanna kind of look at those various scales here. And as I mentioned before, I'm gonna compare the spike code approach, the prevailing approach in neuroscience with what I'm calling um, in this new paper with Mostyn Jones, the EM field hypothesis. And the paper is not published yet, it's in progress. So let's look at the spike code theory. Um, again, this is the conventional view in neuroscience, and we can describe it really succinctly as the view that neuronal and in particular synaptic activities are the key dynamics supporting consciousness in each moment. And so if we peer into the body and brain looking for the neural correlates of consciousness, what we'll find is that electrochemical synapse activities of various types, perhaps in particular areas of the brain, um, are the primary neural correlates of consciousness to use uh, Christoph Koch's language. And um, Koch himself, who I'll rely on quite a bit here uh, as a proponent of the spike code approach, um, is of the view that these synaptic activities are necessary and sufficient for consciousness. And this is a great book, um, 2020 book by Mark Humphreys called The Spike. And it basically goes through the neurophysiology, electrophysiology of how um, visual perception uh, goes through the eye into the brain and creates a conscious percept. 
And so another really good statement to be really kind of clear about what we're looking at here for the spike code approach. This is from an interview I did with Christoph back in 2020. Um, he says the causal actors between neurons that act at the time scale relevant for consciousness, which is in his view, five to 500 milliseconds are action potentials that cause in turn synaptic release of packets of neurotransmitters. Most neurons fire highly irregular spike trains more compatible with a random Poisson process than with a highly synchronized clock process of the sort we're familiar with from electronic circuits. So hopefully it's clear enough what we're talking about with the spike code approach is that we may not understand it in its entirety, but that the synaptic spikes produced by neurons throughout the brain um, are the correct place to look for the dynamics of consciousness. Okay, so then let me sketch out the alternative view. Um, and again, uh, uh, Tam, I have a question. Uh, yep. Uh, given that he's was representing the integrated information theory, it seems that that's a more general theory. Mm -hmm. Was that statement that you had, was that his preference or uh, for consciousness, or was he just giving that as an example of IID? So IIT. he is a proponent of IIT and this book, The Failing of Life Itself, which I recommend highly, the, the second half of the book is all about IIT. And so yes. Koch has helped develop IIT, of course, with Tononi and Tononi's team. And Christoph um, is a proponent of IIT, but also in terms of, you know, human brain physiology and mammal brain mm -hmm. more generally, he would say, as he says here, that where you look for the dynamics of consciousness physiologically are in the synaptic spikes. Okay, thanks. Okay. And so basically IIT would be a more general framework that you can use to characterize any physical system. But for Coke, looking at human consciousness, this is where you look. Okay. So the alternative approach, and again, this is you know very much a minority view today, but growing. You know, we actually are editors of a special research topic of frontiers in human neuroscience, um, gathering papers in this area. And we're up to about a dozen now um, and finding new folks working in this area we didn't know about. Um, so what if the spike code approach overlooks key features of the brain and consciousness? And in particular, what if various scales of EM fields generated by, but really importantly, not identical with the neuroanatomy of the brain are in fact the primary seat of consciousness? This is the hypothesis, okay? So certainly far too soon to make any conclusive statements about it but we're posing it as a hypothesis along with many others. And so in this alternative view, neurons and, synap neurons and synaptic transmission of information are necessary for a consciousness, but they are not sufficient to explain consciousness, at least not our kind of consciousness. And a really good overview of these debates um, is Douglas Field's 2020 book, Electric Brain, and it's not all about this, but he definitely touches on this debate many times. And he concludes that brain waves are key to consciousness, but the results thus far are correlations and don't prove cause and effect. So again, I want to stress this is you know early in this um, general um, research effort, and we can't make any conclusive statements. Okay, so looking at the precise questions we pose in our paper. Um, we look at the various arguments in favor of and against the spike code theory in which regional and global EM fields are largely epiphenomenal, which means they are not causally relevant to brain activity or consciousness, even though they exist. They're like the, the train whistle that makes a noise but has no impact on the workings of the train. Um, and then the second area, again, is the EM field hypothesis in which uh, these fields are only causally relevant but may in fact be the primary seat of consciousness. So I do want to be clear that the EM field approach does not say that synaptic dynamics are not important, not at all. What we're saying is that the synaptic approach is only maybe half the picture. And so where the brain produces various types of EM field phenomena, we need to look to those phenomena in addition to the synaptic dynamics to get a more complete picture of consciousness. 
Okay, so let's review real quick different ways to measure EM fields in the brain. EEG, um, I believe still the most commonly used approach because it's quite easy and quite cheap, um, uses a, a mat of electrodes on the scalp and measures the uh, regional and global EM field effects that can be detected by definition outside of the brain, outside of the skull, outside the scalp. And so it can be fairly crude, but it's a really easy uh, data set to measure. ECOG, electrocorticography, um, goes inside the skull and puts a mat of electrodes on the surface of the brain. So it's more directly measuring cortical activity of the brain. And then LFP, local field potential spikes, um, measures uh, this activity um, with uh, microelectrodes and its different types, uh, platform array, microwires, multi-site probes. And just interestingly, um, I was reviewing um, this paper, GROP et al. 2017, which actually looks at epileptic patients um, using ECOG and electrodes. And they actually concluded that um, theta activity was the most common activity seen in these patients. Um, when you measure with EEG, the generally accepted view is that alpha is more prevalent. But the GROP et al. paper is certainly, I think, provisional and that it's a small data set. Um, epileptic patients, et cetera, they are eyes closed, but conscious. And so it's an interesting question as to what, you know, frequency bands are most, most common. Okay, so let's dive into kind of a fundamental question here. And this is a point that Collins made in his work time and time again. And this is an image from um, his recent paper with Marissa, um, Hales and Erickson, 2022. And, um, <clears throat> This is a, it's both trivial and really important point. Um, there, there is nothing other than EM fields in the brain. The brain is comprised of nothing but EM fields. Um, we could argue perhaps that the strong and weak nuclear fields might be conceptually different category of fields, but they're not particularly relevant to the dynamics of consciousness or of life more generally. And so when we talk about EM field effects in the brain, it's important to recognize that any theory of consciousness that is a, you know, a physical, um, physicalist theory is ultimately an EM field theory of a particular type. So synaptic field theories, synaptic dynamic theories of consciousness are a type of EM field theory. But again, in this approach, this approach we're calling the EM field hypothesis, we're suggesting it's not just synaptic dynamics that are relevant to consciousness. We're suggesting it's local, regional, and global EM field dynamics. Hey, Tam, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, so I, I'm not a physicist, but haven't they like not yet unified all the primary forces yet? Um, and like, couldn't you make an argument that there's like mass or energy gravitational type forces also present? Or is that, um, or do you, you just view the EM field as like most prominent at these higher scales? Or I'm just curious about the, the rationale. Well, the, the primary framing of these forces is, you know, um, a set of four forces. So gravity, EM field effects, and then strong and weak nuclear forces. Those are the four fundamental interactions in today's prevailing physics. And so gravity clearly has minimal, you know, role, right, in the dynamics of consciousness and on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you can fall off a building and die that affects your consciousness, but it's not going to be a particularly relevant thing in the normal workings of the brain, et cetera. And similarly, strong and weak nuclear forces are relevant to nuclear dynamics, the very you know, tiny scale, the center of the atom. But what governs the scale of life and consciousness are EM field dynamics. And that's not controversial, it's just, you know, it's just basic physics. And so, yeah, gravity and strong and weak are relevant, um, but very minimally so. Does that make sense? Of course, Tam, with, if, if you're Roger Penrose, you would say that consciousness has got something to do with quantum gravity um, and, you know, interaction with the brain. Obviously, that's not the conventional view among mm -hmm. physicists and certainly not among neuroscientists. But Yeah, um, certainly there are you know, various outlier theories, and I'm not going to weigh in on Penrose's approach, but his certainly is, is a new and um, minority approach that doesn't have much empirical support. And I believe an experiment came out recently that actually um, weighed against the gravity-based collapse approach that 
Penrose supports. But yeah, there's definitely many other theories out there. To clarify on that, on that recent thing that came out, I talked with Hammeroff and he said, uh, it's this other guy, Diossi, who claims that there's like radiation emitted during the collapse of the wave function. And Penrose never supported that, that framing or that model. And so, yeah, basically they're, they're questioning like lumping the Diossi collapse model with the Penrose style collapse model. And so that, that evidence actually was like more in favor of like the Penrose interpretation, but mm. what, you know, with that, yeah. whatever, kind, kind of adjacent to this talk, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, let, let's say even if Penrose's approach um, would prevail over time in terms of being the preferred explanation, um, it wouldn't actually change this framing of EM fields as being the primary dynamics of consciousness. It would come into the bottom end and would induce that collapse of the wave function and includes the bing moment that, you know, Hameroff and Penrose like to talk about. So it's relevant in that framing, but then the rest of the causal chain uh, would be governed by more normal EM field dynamics, if that makes sense. And I'm not a big fan of the gravity-based approach anyway, so what it's worth. Uh, I'm more of a Bohmian when it comes to quantum theory, but we'll, that's a different talk. Um, okay, so let's move on. So this is a nice diagram from Colin's paper from 2014. I won't go over it in detail. I just kind of want to show that there has been a lot of work by Colin and others looking at the very specific biophysical mechanisms by which neurons produce EM fields at various scales. And so I really strongly recommend you refer to Hale's 2014 for the details on how this stuff works and also Hales and Erickson 2022 for a good follow-up. I wanna also highlight a point that Colin makes and Colin, feel free to chime in here. I don't mean to speak for you, but this is from your paper. Um, you highlight the fact that Maxwell's equations, which of course are the, ba are the basis for EM field theory, classical EM field theory, um, that there is usually a simplification used for the equations um, that doesn't strictly apply to brain dynamics. So you wrote brain tissue is a non-homogeneous, anisotropic, non-stationary, non-linear, far from equilibrium, complex system detailed at the nanoscale. It does not take much analysis to see that the conditions in which, under which Jackson, this simplified approach, validates the macroscopic, macroscopic form are violated by brain tissue. So this is kind of a, an inside baseball comment here, but when we look at EM field dynamics, we need to be careful about which equations we're using and how we actually model those interactions. Colin, do you wanna say anything on that? Um, I haven't actually read that statement for quite a while. I think I still believe myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then I, no, no, the, I actually brought this up in uh, seminars at uni and, um, and yeah, there, there's a bunch of criteria and people regularly dive down deep underneath those and keep going. And uh, it's, it can be troublesome. So uh, just beware down deep. The, there's no such thing as resistance or, or capacitance or any of that stuff down there. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet people take it down deep almost to the atomic level. And they can do useful work, but it's, you know, you're in a, a gray area. So Got it. it I'm glad you agree with yourself. From 2014. Okay, so let's. Um, so my computer is lagging here for a second. There we go. Okay, so I want to just again highlight the notion of different organizational scales in the brain, and um, synaptic dynamics being the most localized EM field dynamics and even the release of neurotransmitters and the action of neurotransmitters, these are all purely EM field dynamics. What's called you know, brain physiology, electrochemistry, um, electrochemical effects. These are all just EM field dynamics of various forms. So it's a really important point to make here. Um, but we're also looking at mesoscale and macro scale or regional and global scale effects in explaining the more uh, large scale functions of consciousness. 
So another um, diagram from Collins 2014 paper, this again shows it some more details uh, for how microscopic, mesoscopic and macroscopic EM fields are produced. And so the first diagram um, on the left is looking at the um, neural level. Um, ECS is extracellular space and ICS is intracellular space. And there are various field effects, even at this scale, um, some static, some dynamic. So it gets very complex, but I just want to kind of highlight these details. And if you want to look at the details in more detail, <laughs> go ahead and look at the paper. One second, I got to let Brian in here. Okay, and then B, uh, looking at the, um, the whole neuron dynamics, how it varies based on the axonal and dendritic uh, components of the neuron. And then um, C, looking at the scalp and whole brain effects. And you see, you know, again, very nested hierarchies of similar kind of toroidal shapes. Um, and those EM field dynamics are gonna have propulsive effects for every scale. And this is what I'm gonna to get to here in a second, showing that these, these, these field effects um, do appear to have actual causal impacts in the workings of the brain and thus in consciousness. Um, this again is, is Hales 2014, looking at the three uh, primary forms of EM field dynamics. And I'll just go over it very quickly. Um, A, electrostatic, um, B, quasi-convection, and C, quasi-electrostatic. And again, I refer to the paper for you know, more discussion on that. Colin, do you want to weigh in on this at all? Do you still agree with yourself on this stuff? All good, yeah. It's, okay. uh, it's just amazing looking at something that I haven't seen for so long. And um, right. yeah, I've, sort of, I've, I'm glad it's, um, it's speaking through the years the way it is. Yeah. Quite surprising. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll I appreciate progress, it. right? Yeah. Yeah, in there. Definitely. Okay, so let, let's look more specifically at problems with spico theory. Like, why would you even want to look elsewhere? If, if the vast majority of neuroscientists and philosophers think that's the right path, you know, who are we to say, uh, you know, not so fast? Now, there are a lot of different critiques we, we could level against this approach. I want to just highlight a few, given, you know, limited time here today. Um, one broad critique is against computationalism more generally. Um, and this is, you know, the idea that we have good um, both data and logic supporting the view that in fact, there's not a computer in our heads per se. It's not a numerical computation working by logic gates. And that's how the spico theory works. It's a computational approach, you know, at its very base. Um, there's a nice summary of these issues, uh, Jones and Rock 2022 in press, I can send to you all. Um, Roger Penrose has done a lot of work going back to Shadows of the Mind and the Emperor's New Brain in the early 90s, um, arguing that um, consciousness is not computable. Uh, and then more recently, Honor Bambani Padyai's group has argued you know, similar um, points based on different, uh, different um, logic chains. Um, there's also some interesting empirical work by Freeman and others, uh, in particular Freeman looking at rabbit brains, um, suggesting that the uh, achievement of synchrony in rabbit brains um, happens much faster than could be achieved through synaptic transmission. And so it's not that this is magical, it's that there's probably some other causal chain going on. And so in this case, um, it may well be, you know, regional and global EM field dynamics, not just that very localized synaptic EM field dynamic. And then the last, um, a fairly big one, is that current spy code approaches um, don't do much to explain consciousness itself. Um, and the book I mentioned earlier, The Spike by Mark Humphreys is, you know, refreshingly honest on this. He says the most obvious chasm in our understanding is in all the things we did not meet in our journey from your eye to your hand, all the things that the mind have not been able to tell you about because we know, so I gotta move the uh, bubble here, because we know so little of what spikes do to make them. And so 
this appears um, to render the spy code approach more of a promissory note in explaining consciousness than any kind of fleshed out theory. And just kind of reflecting on the, on the large scale for this category of, of uh, explanations, you know, I have a hard time personally seeing how this information based, you know, computational approach, looking at information flows through the brain based on spikes, um, comes even close to any kind of explanation of our, our qualia, our feelings in the moment, because it's all fundamentally um, looking at just objective data flows as bits. And so um, IIT makes maybe a little bit of progress toward this explanation by saying, well, all integrated information is consciousness. Um, but of course it leaves quite a bit you know, left unsaid or unexplained through that statement. Um, and I'll suggest in a second here how the EM field approach may do, may do better. Any questions at this point? Okay, so let's look at the alternative M field hypothesis. And again, there's a lot here we could include, but um, I've highlighted a few main ones. And um, when we look at the brain's regional and global EM fields, um, we can reflect how um, our own consciousness changes quite rapidly. Um, we can turn on a dime, we can go from being elated to very depressed in a moment. We can have a totally different train of thought from one second to the next. So clearly these things happen quite quickly in terms of our consciousness. And we can see the similar dynamics when we measure brain activity, whether it's EEG, um, ECOG, LFP, fMRI, et cetera. And so it would suggest um, along the lines of Freeman's work on rabbit brains, that there's something else going on than just the natural dynamics, which are fairly slow compared to other um, dynamics, particularly with regional and global EM fields. Um, a lot of data shows that long range synchrony can be mediated very quickly by regional and global EM fields in terms of various rhythms from data, delta, theta, uh, beta, gamma. And um, you can certainly explain those effects with more strictly synaptic approaches, but it gets more difficult to do so empirically when you look at um, evidence like that supplied by Freeman, et cetera. Um, you know, similarly, the, these states appear, appear and disappear very quickly. And here's a nice quote from Celine Adesoy from a 2016 paper. I think this one was in Nature Communications. Um, this relationship between the frequency of temporal oscillations and the excitation inhibition balance shows remarkable overlap with the neurophysiological changes observed during the loss and recovery of consciousness. So again, suggested without being a slam dunk. And then the, here's a big one, which I'll explore uh, a bit in the next few slides. Um, Ephaptic field effects, which are basically regional and global um, EM field effects, non-synaptic. Um, these effects are real and supported by data. And there's a bunch of new papers out on this, which I'll review in a second. And then here's a key um, step in the logical chain for this approach. Uh, and this actually is similar to IIT in its kind of fundamental posit that under the M field hypothesis, the M field itself is posited to have subjective experience as a fundamental feature. And as those fields complexify, so consciousness complexifies. And as the various M fields synchronize in each moment, that combined experience encompasses the full spatial temporal scale of those fields. Let me give an example. Um, this is from an earlier presentation um, based on my 2020 paper, which offered um, a mathematical approach for quantifying conscious and e consciousness in each moment. And this is just looking at, you know, a hypothetical um, synchronized area of activity in human brain. And I just call this the blob affectionately, um, similar to the dynamic core from Adam Monetinoni's work, the whole from Koch's work and the conscious pilot from Stu's work. Same idea exactly, it's just that there is a, uh, a moving organization of synchronized activity 
in the brain at any given moment. Of course, there can be many more than this one synchronized activity uh, structure, but we can actually characterize this uh, using the various tools to measure um, the brain's EM field dynamics. And we can actually get you know, an answer as to what areas are most functionally relevant in each moment. So let's look in more detail at this really key empirical issue of a faptic field effects. And again, a faptic is just another name for non-synaptic EM field effects. Um, big paper came out in 2019, Chang et al. And they looked at hippocampal oscillations in mice, um, slow oscillations, lower than one hertz. And these are thought to be related to memory consolidation during sleep. And they conclude you know, fairly strongly uh, results support the hypothesis that endogenous electric fields previously thought to be too small to trigger neural activity, play a significant role in the cell propagation of slow periodic activity in the hippocampus. They do stress that their research uh, may not transfer to broader cortical dynamics because of the physiology of the hippocampus. But my view is that later research supports the notion that there is a similar effect um, in, cort in cortex. Um, this result so surprised everyone at the journal they submitted to that the journal made uh, the team, this is, which is Dominic Durand at Case Western, they made them triple check their research. Not double check, but triple check before they published the findings because they knew they'd get a lot of flack and they did. Um, but they still conclude in the paper that their findings strongly support the hypothesis that these waves propagate by effective coupling not through gap junction, not through ion diffusion, but through effective coupling. Um, another interesting paper came out a year later, Rafini et al. And um, they conclude that several decades of research suggests that weak electric fields may influence neural processing, including those induced by neural activity and proposed as a substrate for a potential new cellular communication system, i.e. effective transmission. If haptic interaction may be important for complex processing and biological neural networks because it travels at very fast speeds and provides a potential communication link across distant neurons in the cortex. So again, going back to our general points, this data strongly supports the notion that these larger scale, faster effects may be causally relevant in the workings of consciousness. Now this table is from their supplement, um, which is really good data here. Um, and they're looking, in fact, at the speed of effaptic field effects in various tissues. And the key thing I've highlighted here in the, in the red oval, um, so the speed of light C in a vacuum is extremely fast, of course, um, about 300,000 kilometers per second. Um, they've measured this effect in cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, and it's about one-tenth as fast, which, of course, is still extremely fast. That, about 29,000 kilometers per second. Now it's quite a bit slower uh, in gray matter and white matter um, at a mere 47 kilometers per second and 57 respectively, but it still renders it extremely fast and far, far faster by orders of magnitude than synaptic activity spread across the brain. And so the final column here on the right shows the time it takes to cover 20 centimeters um, in this tissue. And so it's still, for gray matter, only 4.3 nanoseconds to cover that 20 centimeters, which is, of course, you know, halfway across the brain. Um, and in white matter, um, only 3.5 nanoseconds. So basically instantaneously. So not a speed of light, but a respectable fraction thereof. In fact, in white matter, one five thousandth the speed of light. So this is really good new data showing, um, you know, the, the basis for these faster effects. Any questions here? Bernard, you had a question? You're yes, on. Tam, is the definition of effaptic that it doesn't involve neurotransmitters? Evolve what? That it doesn't involve neurotransmitters of some form. Is that the definition? Oh, okay, um, got you. Um, that would be part of it, yeah. It's non-synaptic and therefore non-neurotransmitter based. Yeah. The word derives from EFAPS. They, there was a synapse and an EFAPS in the early days when they started working this oh, out. Oh, I see. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. And what, how did you find the EFAPS, Colin? 
Well, it was it was thought to be a, a kind of a synaptic connection that didn't have a synapse. Uh, it was sort of implicit in field behavior. Um, and this this originated in the early days. It actually originated from uh, battlefield physiological effects where there was a lot of pain caused by faptic coupling between severed nerves. And they, that's where all this started and where the word came from originally. So, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but it's but the assumption is it's an electromagnetic field then. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to be precise, it's going to be a more regional scale or global yeah. scale effect Large than scale. the very localized scale of the synaptic EM field effects. Just again to highlight that point that it's all EM field dynamics, just different scales. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So let's look at some critiques. Um Christoph Koch is not a big fan of this work, even though he's done some work in faptic field effects himself. He's not convinced they actually have the right characteristics to be functionally relevant to consciousness. So looking specifically at Chang et al, and I asked him about this in a 2020 interview I did with him. Um, he, he said, as an experimentalist, I'm skeptical of these claims, Chang et al, in particular given their statistical validity and effect size. Of course, at this point, no neural mechanisms can be de definitely ruled out, including exotic macroscopic quantum effects, as long as they don't violate the laws of physics. So he's skeptical, but open. Um, and so, you know, the response here um, to the quality of the Chang et al study would be, well, they had the, you know, triple check and reproduce their results. And of course, it's not just Chang et al at this point, it's actually at least a dozen papers looking at ephaptic field effects of various kinds. And we'll review those papers in more detail in our draft paper, Hunt and Jones 2022. Won't go through all of it today, but um, you know, I certainly agree with Christoph that we can't make any conclusive um, statements here about the effects of ephaptic uh, field dynamics. But again, this body of data is growing steadily and looking more and more convincing. So another critique he levels um, is the same statement I quoted earlier about you know where 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 is the causal you know action where is the main action in consciousness um, with a brain based view um, and he said you know the causal actor is between neurons that act at the time scale relevant for consciousness at five to five hundred milliseconds or action potentials spikes that cause in turn synaptic release of packets of neurotransmitters. And then he adds, consider the sounds the beating heart makes. These can be picked up by a stethoscope and can be used to diagnose cardiac conditions. However, there's no evidence that the body exploits these sounds for any function. Now I asked um, Wolfgang Kleimesch to respond to this point uh, by Christoph. And he said, with respect to Christoph's view that the brain's M fields are too weak in order to play a role for higher brain functions, he is right if one looks at only one oscillation of the field. The critical point, however, is the interplay and sync between oscillations. Even if each oscillator is weak, sync between them can induce a strong and very selective force. And that statement is again supported by Chang et al, Rufini et al, many other papers. And then um, Georgi Buzaki um, made an interesting statement in a paper from 2004, which looked at a fairly comprehensive level across different uh, mammals and found that the brain's rhythms are quite well conserved across species. And he says, these EM field brain oscillations are phylogenetically preserved, suggesting that they are functionally relevant. Otherwise, why would they be conserved by natural selection? Recent findings indicate that network oscillations bias input selection, temporally linked neurons into assemblies, and facilitate synaptic plasticity mechanisms that cooperatively support temporal representation and long-term consolidation of information. Now, um, a more specific critique that Koch leveled um, refers to the distribution of uh, frequencies, uh, whether you're using EEG, ECOG, LFP, et cetera. And he says the EEG that's recorded from the scalp outside the skull and its sibling, LFP, recorded with electrodes inserted in the cortex proper through the skull, all show peaks at particular frequencies. Yet these are broad and are superimposed onto 
a one over f to the n type of power law decay characteristic of many natural systems. So he included a figure in an interview showing what seems to be a fairly smooth distribution of frequencies. And this, in his view, just shows that, well, this is kind of a mush of um, EM field dynamics that's produced, again, like the heartbeat noise or like the train whistle on a locomotive. Nick, I see your hand. Let me just um, read this and then I can address your question. Sure. So Buzaki in another paper from, 20, paper from 2013 addressed this point and then, you know, he and Koch have worked together. So I'm assuming they've had some dialogue in this, but Buzaki doesn't address specifically Koch's critique, but he addresses it um, in passing in this interesting paper in 2013. And he recognizes, yes, there is a one over F um, distribution that appears to be noise, but he says, nonetheless, when the brain engages in specific functions such as processing, processing sensory stimuli, directing attention to particular features, orienting in space, engaging working memory, or preparing movements, the dynamics of the involved structures changes and particular oscillation frequencies become dominant. In these cases, the frequency power relation deviates from the one over F statistics and a peak or a bump appears in the respective frequency band. So I think this is a pretty important rebuttal to Koch's response or critique. Nikki, go ahead. Yeah, so it was great to see the one over F uh, included in this paper because I'm working on polishing up a slide deck and I'll have it for uh, you and Jonathan to see uh, real soon. But anyway, um, kind of looks like there are two basic types of fluctuations. So periodic, rhythmic, um, scale specific fluctuations, so localized to a particular space and time. And um, so you have alternation between phases of high excitability and low excitability, which basically provide like slots for where perception and action are more likely to occur. And so oscillations, it appears, um, help to coordinate localized activity. Whereas then you have aperiodic, arrhythmic, scale-free or scale-invariant fluctuations, this pink noise, this one over F. And this appears to provide or help maintain system-wide stability across the entire thing. So in terms of causality, I suspect that it's more like a seesaw or a continuous oscillation between, uh, you know, the, the wave level and the and the particle level, just continuously going back and forth like this. And so um, there was also a mention in the paper about two-way causality that Einstein noted that this was often found in nature. This supports what I'm talking about as well. So you have this continuous oscillation between you know, the, the full view, the system-wide view and the particle view. And, um, and this pink noise or this one over F this helps to provide um, system-wide stability. So everything kind of conforms over the, the entire system of the universe, uh, conforms to this power law. And this help, this basically enables like these nested levels um, of consciousness uh, to have some degree of variability in behavior, but maintain stability throughout the entire system. Really cool, so anyway. Yeah, you know, I like that and I agree with all that. Um, and it seems to me that, yes, you may have an averaging effect when you look across a certain time span, but when anything happens to that system, you have various spikes and during particular demanding tasks or all the things that uh, Buzaki mentions, then you have, you know, expectations of the background field, if you will, uh, the background field in this case being the one of ref averaging. And so you have, in fact, kind of a, a another level of, um, kind of metaphorical spiking, if you will, spiking in the EM fields more generally um, that relate to more demanding tasks or specific functions. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. Gotcha. Just one more thing to throw in. So uh, this one over F, uh, it looks like noise, but they make the point that it is not noise. This is not an artifact that should be eliminated. This is an inherent piece of the system. So, and they have- Yeah, functional. yeah, and we had a, a great couple of talks from Thomas Young a couple of years ago, looking at this idea of the spontaneous brain, which is a big new research area. George North has a book called The Spontaneous Brain, looking at this notion that what we thought of as noise for a long time is in fact very functionally relevant. 
Um, so I think there's just a lot going on in his field and a lot of, you know, uh, fermentation and permutation. Um, so yeah, there's a lot there. Thank you. Gotcha. <laughs> sure. Okay, so let's move on. And I do want to kind of close with, you know, recognizing that Chris up himself is not making any conclusive statements. He, he's re remaining open to new data as all good scientists should be. And he says again in the interview, my own group has provided some electrophysiological in vitro evidence that oscillations in the extracellular field at particular frequencies may be able to entrain spikes in a cell type dependent manner. And he cites um, a 2011 paper they published. At this point, we do not know what role such so-called effective coupling uh, play in the human brain. And so I actually have a dialogue still with Koch on this. I sent him a draft paper. I'm waiting for uh, feedback from him on that. Okay, so let's um, end here by looking at, you know, what is the role of effective coupling? Why did nature select for this apparently additional causal pathway in the brain? And to be clear, you know, there are kind of four now pretty well established causal um, mechanisms in the brain, synaptic firing, gap junctions, ion diffusion, and now more recently, effective coupling. Um, so in a special issue of Neuropsychologia, Hansel Meyer et al, uh, I guess last year, uh, wrote that brain oscillations provide temporal structure for neural firing. Such temporal structure is at the heart of the neural syntax and is crucial for efficiently routing information from one brain region to another. Furthermore, the temporal structure of firing has lasting consequences on connections of neural assemblies. And this applies both to synaptic firing and the more regional and global um, EM field effects I'm looking at in this talk. And then Buzaki et al. 2014 um, stated, the multifarious rhythms of the brain form a hierarchical system that offers a syntactical structure with a spike traffic within and across circuits at multiple timescales. So this is, you know, both these are hinting at a very important role of temporal ordering that can be provided by EM field dynamics very precisely, um, given the rapid effects of EM field dyna dynamics at the regional and global scales, and in particular, the almost infinite temporal granularity that these fields can provide, uh, far more granular than synaptic effects in theory. So uh, another key one here, um, in Rafini et al. 2020, um, looks at the possible effaptic effects uh, in preventing hypersynchrony in epileptics. And um, basically they look at the physical unfolding of the brain and what regions are actually close together in epileptic patients. And they suggest that one role of these effects may be to stop the brain going into um, hypersynchronized, which is the seizure state for epileptics. And they say by the same token, the increasing amplitude and spatial extent of electrical activity generated during the last stage of a seizure may act through a fabric interaction as a homeostatic mechanism to end the seizure. So again, new research, very interesting. Okay, so wrapping up here, I wanna kind of give a very simple um, schematic structure to what I've been talking about. Um, again, we are not suggesting that Synaptic dynamics don't matter, not at all. We're saying they matter hugely, but they're not the whole story. Um, in this paper, um, myself, uh, Jonathan, and Marissa wrote, published earlier this year, whereas my consciousness amateur, we suggested a structure that looks at various measurable correlates of consciousness in the three main categories, behavioral, neural, and creative. And then we break the neural correlates, NCC, down into two categories, including synaptic correlates and electromagnetic correlates of consciousness, the EMCC. And I'll give Colin again credit for that phrase. He uses it in the 2014 paper. And so we're suggesting to be really clear that to explain the NCC and thus consciousness, we need to look at SCC plus EMCC. And then a the final kind of metaphor uh, for what um, we're suggesting is going on we state in the paper that the EM field effects produced by the brain um, are generated by, but not identical to the neuroanatomy of the brain. In the same way that a tree grows 
twigs and leaves, but the tree is not identical to the twigs and leaves. The twigs and leaves have their own spatiotemporal structure in the same way that EM field dynamics have their own spatiotemporal structure over and above the neuroanatomy of the brain. And so the neuroanatomy of the brain is being characterized in a large research project in Europe and the US as connectome dynamics, all this work in connect, connectomics. And we're suggesting another phrase, the resonome um, should be looked at with equal diligence in terms of explaining the more detailed and granular structure of consciousness. So that is it. Um, Nikki, is your hand still up or is that from the prior question? Prior, oops, wait, uh, sorry. Right, Jonathan, go ahead. Thanks, Tam, that was, uh, that was great. Um, two questions, actually. Uh, the first is, can you help flesh out the intuition for why uh, equating um, consciousness, sort of the, the arising of consciousness with um, electromagnetic field is more intuitively plausible than um, connecting it with uh, information integration? It's, it, it, they, they both seem like we're going to take this as the uh, foundational source. And I wonder if you could just flesh out that intuition. Yeah, um, I'll give a short answer, but there's a lot more to it than I can address right now. Um, my intuition is that looking to information and in particular integrated information goes a bit too abstract to be particularly useful in explaining consciousness. When we look to nature and to our various theories explaining nature, um, I've kind of gone over in some detail here why EM field dynamics seem to be the relevant causal structure and causal theory for consciousness and biology more generally. And so it seems to me um, the right level of abstraction to look to EM field dynamics to explain consciousness, given that it seems to be the right, right level of abstraction to explain life more generally. And so if we're actually trying to have a theory that is both general, but also specific to our actual world we live in, this seems to me the right level of abstraction. There's also many other problems with IIT that I won't go into right now, but in particular the exclusion principle, uh, which seems to be, in my view, a pretty serious issue for IIT. But I, but you could information integration could still be the um, the key element, even if they've got some of their uh, assumptions wrong. Uh, okay, um, yeah, I'm not sure if that. It, it sounds more like that's a sort of an evidentiary argument uh, rather than one which says that that intuitively or that that in in terms of what would be a satisfying way to um, find a foundation for uh, consciousness in, in reality that uh, electromagnetism is just superior, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. The second question is, um, do you think that, um, I always get the abbreviation of this wrong, TDCIS, so the, uh, where they use <coughs> electrostimulation on the brain, um, is, is that a, um, possible, you didn't mention that approach of electrostimulation on the brain, I don't think, but I'm wondering to what degree is that a uh, important avenue for demonstrating the uh, importance of um, uh, electromagnetic fields, uh, the causal importance of electromagnetic fields? Yeah, it's a great point. And um... TDCS and TMS and all these tools we use that use electrical or magnetic fields to stimulate the brain and, and make changes in consciousness, those are all pretty definitive um, proof that EM fields have an effect on consciousness. The question then becomes, um, are the brain's endogenous EM fields similarly strong such that they can induce those kinds of effects or are the exogenous fields being applied far stronger than the endogenous fields? And so that's an empirical question, but yeah, logically it's definitely support, but you need to have that empirical overlay to make a strong argument. 
so would um, would one prediction then be that if you had um, uh, really really low of electromagnetic field stimulation comparable to the um, kind that uh, are generated um, in the brain and, and, and show that even at that low level, you have effects that, that would maybe speak to Christoph's concern that the uh, that they're simply not strong enough to- Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that would be good, good data to get. I'm sure there's some out there. Uh, I get then the question would be then, you know, is it, um, similar enough to endogenous field effects to be, you know, good data, uh, because by definition, it's going to be imposed from the outside. But if, if Maria is on the call, I'm curious what you think, because you've done all the work with uh, TFUS. And I'm curious if you thought about this effect in terms of um, obviously, you know, ultrasound is again, a species of ultimately EM field effects mediated by mechanical effects. Maria, are you on the call still? Yeah, I'm here. Um... <clears throat> Let me see. Hold on. Did you hear Jonathan's question? I did. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it is interesting because people really report differential effects with TCS, right? Like some people say that it really affects their awareness and their, their state of consciousness quite a bit, whereas other people, it's really hard to sometimes replicate responses. And my thinking behind that is that I, I feel like there's just such powerful buffer systems for insulating and maintaining like well-managed electric field dynamics in the brain that it, it can be challenging to influence those in a more broad way. I mean, even like um, in surgery, right, where you're directly using electrical activity to modulate, and modulate a circuit with some sort of like measurable outcome, like you're causing the hand to move or you're causing speech arrest. Um, only in like rare cases of uh, direct brain stimulation, whether it's inside of the OR or if it's in the case of ECOG, do you get any kind of like perceptual shifts in people? And I think that maybe that just goes back to perhaps the idea that it's not like a localized region that's um, causing consciousness or affecting consciousness, um, but perhaps that the whole brain is playing into this and that maybe it actually takes quite a bit of training to notice something. So I think a more of a challenge is like, how do we measure it? Measure the um, input or measure the, the effect of the input or both? Measure the effect of the input and really both because we, you know, there's been a lot of questions in the field um, with any of these techniques, whether they're vibrational by using ultrasound um, or electrical or magnetic, you know, what, what, is, what is the actual effect of this force that's getting down to the tissue? And, you know, I mean, ultrasound is probably the, the easiest one that has been to measure because, you know, you, you can do something that wouldn't be appropriate in the lab, but is appropriate in the clinic where you turn the ultrasound up to a thermal stimulus, which is above FDA safety limits, but appropriate for um, a surgical application. Like if you're, you know, when they're doing those exploratory uh, thalamic ablation surgeries, where they actually will turn the ultrasound up to heat the tissue slightly and stimulate it at a much higher intensity that I would you know, safely want to do to just a regular volunteer. Um, and you can measure MR thermography and actually see that you're, you know, changing part of the tissue and then getting some sort of effect change in, in sensory or physiology. But yeah, I think, I mean, it's very challenging to, to even know what you're putting into the system and then to try to figure out how to measure it. Right. Thanks, buddy. Um, yeah. What, just one more. <clears throat> One more follow up on this. Um, so uh, I, I think you were saying that th one of the key elements is that even though the signal strength of uh, EM fields is, is quite small, uh, somehow the layering or integration, I think you had a quote uh, from someone uh, to this effect. Um, so I wonder if you could first off sort of flesh out that point about the um, <clears throat> how it's the combination or integration or however 
it was said in that quote. And then is it possible that that would be the way to show more significant uh, effects by somehow figuring out, uh, mirroring the kind of combination of EM fields that the brain generates and, and seeing their impact? Are you asking me or Maria? I was asking you, Tim, but okay. happy to hear Maria too. Yeah, I'm happy to defer. You know the quote yeah. that I'm talking about? Do you remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, the Climash quote. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can't really weigh in more on that other than what Climash said. I've not reviewed the data on brain simulation to see if they've been trying to mirror endogenous field effects. So Maria or anyone else, if you want to weigh in on that, please do so. Um, I don't know about that with, with brain stimulation, but what I will say is that um, there has been a really interesting amount of work done with that with prosthetics, where people are actually trying to um, meet a level. I think it's just looking at spike coding, um, but they are, rather than just like cranking up or down some, some generic electrical simulation, uh, there has been work to look at mirror spike, mirroring naturalistic spike coding that you might get in response to touch. And that has been much more um, successful at producing a realistic uh, or just less uncomfortably like, synthetic response from getting um, having a prosthetic with an integrated electrical interface. But there's still a lot of work to be done in that field. I... Could maybe speak a little bit about that in the brain, but I, I, I'm not really prepared to comment on it at length at the moment. Yeah, it's a great question, Jonathan. I'll, I'll yeah. do some research on this, and if anyone else wants to, you know, chime in, please do so. Um, yeah, I, I can make a comment real quick. Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, a lot of my own research is like doing brain stimulation. Typically, you know, the tradition has been like you target a single frequency band, um, and so you're like targeting, you know either electrical stimulation or magnetic stimulation sort of hitting a single oscillation. I think there's some people starting to um, target, uh, target cross-frequency coupling or, or thinking about targeting aperiodic signal, stuff like that, like the one over F, um, sort of new days. And I think there's also a big push right now um, to do a lot of closed loop stimulation. So, you know, recording brain activity and then targeting Sometimes you're targeting directly the brain activity you're recording, or other times it's like you have some sort of like therapeutic stimulation, particularly like, like deep brain stimulation with Parkinson's, for example, um, where like you have some like pathological signals you can record, and then you have some sort of stimulation that reduces pathology. And so you're kind of like trying to pair those two together. Um, but yeah, I think I think the the new frontiers are like trying to think about um, multi-scalar stimulation in some way or, or trying to think about the aperiodic signal more critically. Yeah. Super, cool. thank you. Thanks, Justin. Are you finished, John Jonathan? Should we go on to Bernard? Mm -hmm. Great, Bernard, go ahead. Um, Tom, there was a remark on one of your slide, which uh, it, it rather puzzled me. I'm not sure if you're quoting your own view or someone else's, but I think you ba it basically said the electromagnetic field is itself conscious and from a philosophical point of view I, I was trying to work out what exactly you meant by that i mean i could understand that if you've got a very complicated electromagnetic field such as associated with the brain that that could be conscious but presumably if you have a really simple electric magnetic field like the the, the spherical field associated with an electron or something like that a charged particle are you, are you saying that's conscious in some rudimentary way? And if you have, if we take something more complicated, like a, the electromagnetic wave, which is carrying a television or a radio transmission, presumably you're not saying that it's conscious of the own, of the met, of the meaning itself. So can you elaborate on exactly what you mean by the statement that the electromagnetic field is conscious? Yeah, let me unpack that. and. Um... That was um, a posit of the M field hypothesis as we frame it in our paper. Um, and also in, for example, Hunt and Schooler 2019. Um, and so this is a more empirically, um, I guess, granular version of panpsychism. 
And in the 2019, 2019 paper, we explicitly say that our theory of consciousness, GRT, general resonance theory, uh, includes as an axiom uh, panpsychism. And this is, of course, a very long discussion in itself. And yeah. we don't delve into it in that paper. But let me just suggest here now that um, the reason we choose that axiom is that the alternatives, um, basically emergentism of various forms, just don't add up empirically or logically. And so in a way, we're kind of forced into panpsychism. Now, I need to add that Jonathan in that paper adds a footnote saying he is open to other possibilities such as dualism. Um, but I'll let Jonathan speak for himself on that. Um, so yes, to address your question explicitly, um, in this framing, uh, the electrons EM field would have a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit of consciousness, and it complexifies. So an electron will be complexifies. But, but, so an electron will be conscious, but a neutron, a neutral particle, wouldn't. Wouldn't be exactly. At least not based oh, well, on EM field dynamics. I mean, it may, it may be other properties of the neutron itself that also includes some species of rudimentary consciousness, but under the EM field hypothesis, it would not. Okay, but the neutron is made of quarks, which are charged, so I suppose... Right, so the, the quarks themselves, yeah, and it may maybe neutralizes yeah. in that particular structure, but that's probably, you know, beyond where we need to go today. Okay, uh, so it is explicitly panpsychic, so that's fine, and, uh, and the only other thing I would say is that from a physicist's perspective, um, I don't see why you have to say it's a unique feature of electromagnetic fields. I mean, I could say they're gravitational fields, which are space curvature, and that those are also conscious. I mean, so, of course, they're not associated. I agree with you entirely when you said the brain is only, we're only interested in electromagnetic fields. But as a general sort of philosophical statement, I don't see why consciousness might not be just as much associated with a gravitational field as an electromagnetic field. Yeah, it gets complex because, you know, I'd say probably the prevailing view of gravity now is as a curvature effect with space-time, yeah. which, which renders it less of a, a fundamental interaction than a topological theory of the nature of space-time, right? So in that topological approach, it's not really a field in the same way that an EM field is a field. And so it's not necessarily a property of matter it's a property of the space-time continuum. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, but I mean, there are other views. And I mean, right. you know, right. if, you, if you have the philosophical view that in some sense, your mental experience is space-time itself in, in some sense, then it would make, it would be quite acceptable to associate gravity with mental experience. Because I mean, it's, what you were perceiving itself is a manifestation of the curvature of space-time. Yeah, I'm certainly, I'm open to the notion that all the fundamental forces have some associated um, consciousness, again, as kind of a fundamental feature, but I would have, again, refer to the fact that um, in today's physics, fairly uncontroversially, the biophysics, you know, we, we use is through and through EM field dynamics. So it's yeah. just kind of the obvious place to look for, for this yeah. effect. Could I just put in a, a little footnote on this in that part of the problem with consciousness and describing its origins is there's a conceptual barrier with people not really coming to grips with the idea of being something. I mean, we are, we are literally made of something. And when we look at what we are made of, it has the appearance of uh, field systems and gravity and neutrons and all this stuff, but there's nothing else there except space. And when you look at the, the sort of dominance of electromagnetism in that answering that question, what are you like, what am I Colin Hales actually made of to one part in some very large, like 20 digit number, I'm an electromagnetic field. And the information content in the structure of that field, the richness of it and the coherence of it is the, is the origins of somehow um, of at the first person perspective of being EM fields. And yet you sort of have to be able to switch your brain between these, this objective and subjective view in order to make sense of the, of, of our position in the scheme of things. And the answer is, is 
going to be a combination of what you said and what Tam said. You don't, when you say I am electromagnetic field, you get everything like down to whatever Planck scale phenomena are going on down deep in the fabric of reality. You don't get to be electromagnetic fields and not be any of those things. You are electromagnetism because all of those ultra tiny scale Planck phenomena are part of you as well. And it, the whole thing becomes unified with space eventually. Mm. So all, all of these things are going to have to be answered all at once. And in terms of the gravity EM mm. thing, I, I would say that you probably, because you are everything, you know, there's a thousand layers of nested structural hierarchy. You have to be all of them. Gravity comes along for the ride. Space comes along for the ride. EM comes along for the ride. But the one with all the content, with all the, all the information is actually EM. But down deep, all of that stuff has to be there. And that means that the gravity probably has to be there as well. And so, yeah, I, and that's where the panpsychist perspective gets constructed. It's that moment where these things act as a unity. And, no, uh, I, I, I agree. And, and after all, I mean, your brain is, is, is almost completely empty space because yeah. even, the atoms are, <laughs> even the atoms are mainly empty space. So well, it isn't, it isn't. I mean, people say that, but it's actually 100% full of EM fields. Oh, yes, it's full not, of yeah. fields, but I mean yeah. empty of particulate yeah. matter. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, thanks, Bernard. We, we haven't. Yeah. Anyway, I'll leave it. There. Good questions. <laughs> thanks. Nikki, go ahead. Hey, Tam, just a quick question. I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong or misunderstood, um, it looked like there were a couple references to fields being more granular. And so I was just curious about your sort of definition of granular there, because if you look it up it means uh you know contains grains or particles so i figured i'd yeah I'd well missing i can refer to the image right now on the screen here to illustrate that point so okay. um looking at the the trees uh trunks and um and larger branches uh compared to the smaller branches twigs and leaves that's what i'm referring to is that the regional and global em field dynamics of the brain are like the twigs and leaves. They're more spatiotemporally granular than the trunks and branches. And so they, they have higher information carrying content, higher inform, information integration capacity. And so whether we're looking at a you know, framework of you know, IIT or GRT or other uh, quantitative approaches, uh, there's a lot more information carried in, in those EM field dynamics than there is in purely the neuroanatomy. Does that make sense? So in the sense of um, being able to transport sort of vertically up and down the nested hierarchy, that kind of thing? Yeah, I guess the hierarchy extends cool. a lot, a lot yeah. further than just the branches and the, and the trunks, right? There's a lot okay. more to cool. it. And the canopy yeah. is a great, the, for, the forest canopy is a great metaphor for the global EM field effects of the brain, where if you have a wind that comes along, let's say an, an exogenous EM field effect, it might rustle the leaves and twigs, but have no actual perceptible impact on the trunks. Right, so it's actually a really nice metaphor. Gotcha, thanks for the clarification. Yeah, Jeff, go ahead. Thanks, Tam. So this, this feels um, very nice and intuitive, the EM theory. And part of the reason I think that does for me is that it seems to open the door, leave the door open, uh, shall I say, uh, to some of the subjective observations and reports that come from very different traditions like the meditative and the vedic traditions um, it seems that this could leave the door open to some of their descriptions of you know frankly bizarre stuff like non-local phenomena the brain and the mind as a receiver of consciousness mind-to-mind -mind communication as such so if you could comment about that and maybe around the fact that um you know the, the training that's required to get uh, to that level, so to speak, seems to involve the production of, e, of EEG frequencies like gamma that may be more susceptible or may be a necessary substrate for this kind of EM field to EM field stuff. So, yeah, I would say it does allow for um, phenomena like, in particular, uh, telepathy. And I'm not taking a position on the empirical data for telepathy, but this framework certainly does recognize that 
if in fact human awareness is purely an EM field phenomenon, then it's simply an empirical question as to what forces are able to reach any particular individual. And there's an interesting metaphor that Paul Nunez fleshes out in his work, and he's been a you know major neuroscientist for a long time, looking at the brain as basically a, a supercritical state akin to um, a radio, in that you know very small signals can in fact be received by that radio and may have uh, a larger or smaller effect based on the state of the, the radio, AKA the brain. And so it's just an empirical question, you know? And so you look at the data and, um, you know, anecdotally I've had some people who seem pretty damn telepathic at times. Um, and so I'm open to that, that possibility. And this kind of renders all that stuff, you know, uh, scientific and not, not woo, you can actually test it. When I build my chips, oh, sorry, go on. So, okay. Nikki, did you have a question still, or was that from before? Apologies. Yeah, that's what's from before. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Uh, anyone just else? A, go ahead, Colin. Just a, just a footnote. When I build these chips, uh, if I live long enough, I'll uh, we'll be able to do some empirical work on on the connection between two separate resonance systems at distance. Uh, at quite some spectacular levels of um, resolution, like down to the nanometer, fabricating things at the nanometer level. So uh, down the track, there's an answer to that question. It's just a matter of uh, exploring it correctly. Yeah, uh, we'll see. I, I think it would predict, um, and forgive me if I'm wrong on this, but wouldn't it predict that if you um, had a, tel uh, a reliable telepathy paradigm, um, that if you put one person in a lead room, that uh, they would no longer be uh, receptive? You mean like in a Faraday cage? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be, I, mean, I think there's actually been some work on this and I don't recall the outcomes, uh, but yeah, a Faraday cage approach would be a nice one to, you know, if you, if you have someone who can reliably demonstrate some kind of psi phenomena and then you put them in a Faraday, yeah, Faraday way, way, that would be a nice, you know, demonstration that it is likely an EM field phenomenon, right? The claims are that that doesn't stop it, but uh, hmm. obviously many people won't believe that. Mm -hmm. Tam, I, I must apologize to you and to everybody because um, it's very late in England and I, I'm beginning to fall asleep. My electromagnetic brain waves as <laughs> going into sleep mode. So um, I hope I, apologies for leaving a little bit early, but I've really enjoyed your talk and um, thank you so much. And, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, yeah, see you soon. So I'll, I'll wish you good night, although I know it's not good night in California. <laughs> or in Hawaii. <laughs> cool. Uh, any final questions or comments or should we go ahead and wrap it up? Oh, I don't want to make the whole thing. No, no, we're, we're, we're finished anyway, Bernard. This, this oh, is okay. we normally close anyway. Great. Well, thanks everyone so much. Um, great feedback. And I'll share the uh, recording when it's ready. See you soon. Thanks, it was yeah. great, Tam. Thank Can you. I have one last um, comment? Yeah, go ahead, Colin. It, it, having involved myself in this for so long, I'm finding your talk is, is starting to have the maturity and depth and breadth of other like major paradigms and thinking, which it takes quite some time to develop. And it's a really good sign. I'm just in, kind of impressed that we've come such a long way. And yeah. uh, well, thanks for your work on this. And we're, we're now able to depict this stuff with a uh, depth and clarity, which, which wasn't there like even five years ago. It's amazing. So keep going. Yeah, <laughs> progress. Yeah. It's so a really nice good talk. Now. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On behalf of the entire general resonance theory team, I'd like to thank you for watching. Don't forget to like this video, share it, add a comment, and subscribe for more content. We'll see you next time.